Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. It's a passage you're very well familiar with. And uh, while you're turning to Romans chapter 10, let me just say how much Christy and I appreciate your prayers. <laughs> this first week, first full week in Texarkana has been an interesting one. Uh, we do actually have belongings now. So, uh, yeah, all of our stuff arrived on Friday morning. So, it's going to take uh, weeks to get it all unpacked and in place, but uh, it's here. So, we're getting back to some sense of normalcy. Uh, we had, when we first uh, got to town, we, uh, in, in the house, we set up some, some air mattresses. You know, not the kind you take to like camp or mission trip. I mean, they're pretty nice, you know, they're about that high. But we didn't have any chairs, so we went to Home Depot and got a couple of lawn chairs that, that rock. You know, I, I call them redneck recliners, but uh, we were all set for a while, but uh, now we, we, got, we, got, uh, we got a real bed to sleep on, and we got stuff, and uh, it's interesting how much emphasis we, we put on things sometimes, but uh, anyway. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks for all the encouragement. For those of you who brought the delicious meals, thank you for the tasty food and the extra poundage. Um, anyway, uh, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 9 through 17 this morning together. Beginning in verse 9, the Apostle Paul says there in a very familiar passage, If you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on Him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about Him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obey the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord... Who has believed our message? So, faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ. Let me ask you a warm-up question this morning. What's your typical response when you lose something? Panic? <laughs> Maybe you run around in circles and scream? Uh, maybe you turn to one of your coping mechanisms, eat, 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 eat lots of chocolate or that kind of thing? If you like me, you probably look in the car, you look under the sofa cushions, you look under the bed, or maybe you try to remember where it was when you used it last and retrace your steps. Or if it's your phone, you just call from a different phone, right? I'm listening for the ringtone. Um, uh, there have been many times when I've spent, you know, 20, 30 minutes searching the house for my car keys only to realize they're in my pocket the whole time. Or you, maybe you, you just, you resign, you give up, and whatever that item was that you lost, you, you go to the store and you buy a replacement item, only to come back home and find the original item. So now you've got two of them. There is a helpless feeling when something or someone precious to us is lost. I think back to a few years ago when we had AT&T technicians come to the house on two different occasions. And both times... They did not latch the back gate at our house. And both times, our dogs got out. Now, the second time it happened, our schnauzer, Sam, he got out and he was gone for hours. And when we scoured Northwest Lubbock looking for him the whole time, I think back, well, 50 years ago now, I can still remember how helpless and how panicked I felt when I got lost, separated from my parents at Six Flags. Well, consider this, church. As much as we want to help rescue a loved one who was physically lost, understand that God has an infinitely greater desire for those who are spiritually 
lost. It's estimated that over two-thirds of the world's population do not know Jesus Christ. They're in need of a spiritual search and rescue. Well, guess what? One way that you and I reflect our love for Christ is by sharing His desire to reach those who do not yet have a relationship with Him. Being on mission with God means that each of us looks at that monumental task as our own responsibility. Only then does reaching the world go from mission impossible to mission possible. Now, before we really dive into uh, the passage this morning, I want to give you a little bit of historical context, because before we can really learn how to apply the Scripture to ourselves in the here and now, we really have to understand what was being said to the original recipients back in the then and there. Okay, so this passage, Romans 9 through chapter 11, Paul is sharing his concerns about the nation of Israel with Roman Christians. He had expressed sorrow over the fact that Israel had largely rejected Jesus. And rather than believe in Christ and be saved, most of the Jewish people had refused to confess Him as Lord. Instead, they continued to believe that they could somehow be made right in the eyes of God by keeping the Old Testament law. In fact, really I think the theme of chapter 10 is this that there's no excuse for the Jews not to believe the gospel because God has sent preachers to preach the good news generation after generation so that they can respond in faith, not rebellion. So that's really the undercurrent of what Paul is saying here in in that passage. And there's a word for us in all of that too. Likewise, for you and I, there is no excuse for not believing and sharing the good news of Christ. Time and again, Paul affirmed that salvation comes through Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, just like we were singing a few moments ago. For that reason, because salvation is through Him alone, everyone needs to hear that message. And that's the big idea that I want you to get from our passage today, that God desires for all people to hear and to respond to the gospel. All right, so three key thoughts about salvation that I want you to get today for the message. Three three pegs to hang our hats on today, all right? Here's the first one. The message of salvation is summed up in our confession and our belief in Christ. Let me say that again. The message of salvation is confession and belief in Christ. Now, as we read these first couple of verses, verses 9 and 10, I want you to listen specifically for what is necessary for salvation. Rereading verse 9 here, Paul says, If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation. So notice there's two key words that Paul is using here to convey a right relationship with God through Christ. All right, there's confess. We, we verbally confess. We declare and believe. The message of salvation here is about two things, confessing Christ and believing in Christ. Now let's drill down a little bit and, and examine those two thoughts a little bit more closely. First of all, confessing. Now, confessing, confession, really has to do with acknowledging Christ through words. Now, as I'm examining this passage, you know, the, 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 the context really brings to mind the person who confesses to a crime. Now, obviously, believing in Christ is not a crime, at least not in the United States of America. You might be persecuted for it in other countries. But it, it makes me think of the, the, the police dramas. If you watch you know, police shows, courtroom dramas, you, you understand. My parents, for, for years and years, were diehard, diehard Matlock fans. I mean, every Tuesday, it was Chili Dogs and Matlock. I mean, and for about 10 years, you know, he was on the airwaves uh, every Tuesday night from about mid-80s to mid-90s, something like that. And every week, Matlock, you know, the the southern lawyer with the twang, played by Andy Griffith, he would cleverly question a witness until they just, they broke down on the stand and admitted to committing the crime. 
Or if you want a more contemporary example, if you ever watch Blue Bloods, time and again, Danny Reagan, he'll catch the alleged perp, put him in the interrogation room, and convince him to write down his statement about what he'd done. Now, we call that statement a confession. The, the criminal acknowledges having committed a crime by providing a truthful, detailed statement. Well, similarly, you know, the person who receives Christ makes a truthful statement with his or her mouth. Now, for a believer, though, what exactly is it we're confessing? Obviously, we're not confessing a crime. The analogy ends there, all right? <laughs> confessing Christ is not a crime. What are we confessing? It's a couple of things, all right? According to Paul, the first is that we're confessing that Jesus is God. We put our confession in the words that can be read or heard, a confession about Jesus. In fact, the, the word that Paul uses in the original Greek is uh, homologeo. It means to say the same thing or to agree with. So when we confess that Jesus is Lord, we're not only sincerely and truthfully acknowledging that we've given our lives to Him, we're agreeing with God that Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is Lord. Three key words. In, in the Greek, it's, it's kurion iesun. It's the earliest confession in the history of the Christian church. But those three little words, Jesus is Lord, pack a whole lot of meaning. Uh, that original Greek word, uh, kurios, in its basic form here, in this particular context, it's actually the same word that the Jews would have used to refer to God Himself. So this statement, this truthful acknowledgement, is one that Jesus of Nazareth is fully God. We're confessing that Jesus is God, but Jesus is Lord. It's also a confession of something else, that Jesus is Master. As our Lord, our confession also implies that He has complete authority over us because we belong to Him now. You may recall what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. He talks about how we are not our own because we have been bought with the price. Of course, that price was the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Well, confessing Jesus as Lord implies that, yeah, He owns us. He's the boss. We take His reign over us seriously. We have surrendered to Him and are ready to go wherever He wants us to go. Or to put it more simply, the implications of confessing Jesus as Lord, it means an agreement with and a commitment to that truth that Jesus is God. And it means choosing to allow Him to be the Lord of your life the boss. All right, let me recap just a bit. Romans 10, 9, and 10, it provides us a, a powerfully concise explanation of the gospel message. And it's not the route to a relationship that's promoted by other worldviews and philosophies we hear in the world today. You see, our human tendency is to think that we have to do certain things to earn our salvation. Hey, but you know what? God knew we couldn't do that. He knew that we could never be perfectly obedient. We could never follow all the rules. We could never become holy enough and perfect enough to earn a place on His roster in heaven. And so what did He do? He sent His Son, Jesus. Jesus came to this planet. He did what you and I could never do. He lived the perfect life of obedience to God, the one that we couldn't live. And His obedience was so perfect, so complete, that He even gave His life as a perfect sacrifice to pay the price for our disobedience. And so, this passage boils the Christian life down to one thing, faith. But what Paul has done here is he's using a couple of different words in writing about belief. Two, two words that are kind of, you know, two sides of the same coin. 
confessing is the first one. But then the, the second word he uses is believing. Yes, we confess Christ as Lord, but at th that confession of ours, that's actually an outward expression of something that's already transpired inwardly. It's an expression of our faith in who Jesus is, the resurrected Savior and Lord, God the Son. We believe that, yes, Jesus is God. We believe that He is our Master. And we believe that He rose again to prove that those things are true. So our belief in Christ, you know, it's not just some sort of uh, mental agreement, some mental thing, a mental intellectual assent that, yeah, okay, Jesus is God. Yeah, He's, he's Lord. Now, a lot of people believe certain facts about Jesus. They may believe in the historical Jesus. Who knows? They may be even believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But that's not enough to save a person. They haven't believed it here. You know, that mental agreement has not migrated, you know, the, the 14 to 16 inches to here. Let me see if I can illustrate the difference for you. Back in the 19th century, there was this tightrope walker, French dude named Charles Blondin, okay? Now, if he's French, it's probably more like Charles Blondin, but uh, that's just weird. I'm not going to pronounce it that way. So, Charles Blondin, uh, the year was 1859, and this famous tightrope walker has vowed to walk the 1,100-foot span across the famous Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Well, he prepares, he plans, it's promoted, huge crowds arrive. And on the day of the event, he asks the crowd, Do you believe that I can walk across the falls and back on a tightrope? Yes, we believe! And that's exactly what he does. He walks across Niagara Falls and back on a tightrope. Okay, so he's already wowed the crowd, but here's the next thing. He says, do you believe that I can push a wheelbarrow on this tightrope across the falls and back? Yes, we believe! And that's exactly what Blondin does. Pushes the wheelbarrow across and back. At this point, he really ups the ante. He, he ups his game. He says, do you believe that I can push this wheelbarrow across the falls and back with a person in it. Oh, yes, we believe, we believe. And so he turns to the crowd and says, who will get in? <laughs> See, there's a huge difference between head knowledge and heart knowledge, between, you know, this mental agreement and a heart commitment. You see, believing in Jesus means that you are getting in the wheelbarrow. You know what I'm saying? You are all in. Now, in Baptist life, we, we often speak of the, the public profession of faith. Okay? Now, traditionally, the public profession of faith is the act of baptism, following the Lord in believers' baptism. Baptism is an outward symbol of an inward transformation. It's identifying with the body of Christ. It's identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as we have died to an old life and we are risen to a new life in Him. But you see, practically speaking, our very lives are meant to be a public profession of our faith, a daily confession, if you will, of Jesus as Lord in both our words and our deeds. All right, so, so far we've seen in verses 9 and 10 that the message of salvation is confession and belief in Christ. Now, as we move to verses 11 through 13, we're going to find that the message of salvation in Christ is for all. As we read those three verses, uh, I want you to, to listen specifically for who will be saved. In verse 11, Paul says, For the Scripture says, Everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, according to verse 12, 
Who is it that God desires to be saved? Paul says both the Jew and the Greek. Now, more often than not, when you see that term Greek in the New Testament, it's not just referring to people from a Grecian culture. It's usually meaning everyone other than the Jews, like Jews and Gentiles. Some, some translations will say Gentiles. Gentiles, Greeks. So, he basically means Jews and non-Jews. So, what then does the Bible mean in verse 13 when it says everyone? <laughs> it means everyone. That's why Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, that it's God's desire that none should perish, but that all come to repentance. So as you read 2 Peter 3, 9, what do those words none and all mean? They mean none and all. But here's an interesting question. If it is in fact God's desire for everyone to be saved, then why don't you just, you know, snap his proverbial fingers and instantly bring that reality into existence? Well, the short answer is two words. Free will. <laughs> he created us with a choice. Love that's coerced is really not love at all. I mean, even if Ramil Devane, who had a massive crush on Harry, had been successful in giving Harry that love potion that instead Ron Weasley ended up consume, consuming mistakenly, would the result have been true love? No. It really would have been more of a form of slavery. And kudos to you if you got that uh, movie reference. But forced love is not love. God is not going to force you to love Him. You know, He doesn't look down upon us from heaven and say, Love me, tiny people! Well, actually He does, but He does it in a way that He gives us freedom of choice. Yes, we should love Him. Because he's holy and he's awesome and he's good and we extol those qualities. Uh, we sing his praises because of those things every Sunday. But he does not force us to love him. God will not force you to do that. He gave you a choice. He wants us all to choose him freely of our own accord. But now, according to verse 13, what responsibility does that place on the individual? who's in need of salvation. Well, according to Paul, they've got a call upon the name of the Lord. They must confess verbally that Jesus is Lord. And they must believe internally that Jesus died for our sins and that He was raised from the dead. You see, folks, there's still only one way to God, and that's through Jesus. So, you know, salvation and eternal life you know, they're, they're not some sort of uh, free-for-all with many different paths to God that are equally valid. But that having been said, salvation is free for all. Uh, let me see if I can illustrate this. It kind of seems like the age of the cafeteria is coming to a close. Uh, back where we lived before we moved to Texarkana, uh, we had two first cafeterias. I enjoyed eating there. Uh, a little too much. But uh, both of them closed. I understand that back in the day, Bryce's Cafeteria here in Texarkana was really something. Uh, I'm getting a lot of amens, a lot of head nods. There's something appealing about having a selection, about having choice. And think about all of the different choices available to you. You know, maybe you're into the purple hulled peas and the fried green tomatoes and, and the red beans and the, and the greens cooked with chunks of ham and all sorts of potatoes and, and cheesy macaroni casseroles and rice casseroles and buttered cauliflower and, well, maybe not cauliflower, you know, but you get the idea. Now, set all of those beside a couple of crunchy pieces of fried chicken or maybe big old chunks of sweet ham. And for dessert, choose from coconut pie, hot cobbler, or some delicious nana pudding. You know, to borrow a slogan from, from Burger King from back in the day, have it your way. There's something great about having choice. But you see, access to God is not some of sort of spiritual smorgasbord, as much as a lot of folks would, would like it to be. 
You see, the skeptics and the critics of Christianity have ridiculed Christianity because of its exclusivity. You know, the exclusivity of Christianity, the fact that Jesus is the only way to God. But here's the thing. He is. I mean, he said it himself, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. You see, as Josh McDowell put it some years ago, actually Josh McDowell, I think, was, was paraphrasing C.S. Lewis when he said this, but he said, Jesus was one of three things. He was either a lunatic, and just a crazy man with delusions of godhood, or he was a liar, which made him the greatest con man in the history of the world, because think about all the civilizations that have been changed because of Christ. Or he was exactly who he claimed to be, Lord. Now, if you believe one of those first two, well, then you don't believe in the exclusivity of Christianity, the exclusivity of the gospel, because you're not acknowledging Jesus as Lord. But if you do confess Jesus as Lord and you embrace that exclusivity of the gospel, the truth that there's only one path to God, well, then there's another truth that you actually embrace in the process. That is the inclusivity of the gospel. Okay, so how is the gospel inclusive? It's inclusive in the sense that salvation is available for all, anybody, everyone, everywhere. Now, earlier in the letter, Paul, he gave us a pretty somber truth in uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, when he said that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sinners need salvation. But since all of us have sinned, it follows that God's salvation is also available for all all of us who choose to repent and believe. And by quoting uh, Joel chapter 2 verse uh, 32 here in verse 13, Paul really can't make it any clearer than he has when he says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the inclusivity of the gospel, that a relationship with God is available to anyone who would repent, believe, and receive. Those that acknowledge their need for a Savior, and then they choose to trust in Christ, that relationship is open to any and to all who choose to trust. And remember, it's your choice. God won't make you choose. All right, so let, let, me, let me summarize just a bit. Again, just because God's salvation is available to all, you know, it doesn't come in some sort of pick and choose, golden corral, smorgasbord of plans. God doesn't have one plan of salvation for one group of people and a different plan of salvation for another group of people and so forth. Instead, there is one simple plan. Any and all who look to Christ and call on Him will receive eternal life. You see, whether we like it or not, the gospel is for the people we like and for the people we don't like. The gospel is for both our friends and for our enemies. The gospel is for people we would love to see become believers, but also for people that deep down, if we really admit to ourselves, we don't think they deserve to be saved. It's for all of them. The gospel is for everyone, all men, all women, all kids, fat kids, skinny kids, kids that climb on rocks, tough kids, sissy kids, even kids with chicken pox. Okay, now if, uh, <laughs> if you got that obscure reference to that Armor Hot Dogs commercial from the early 1970s, kudos to you. And yes, Advertising in the early 70s was not politically correct. <laughs> but I think I made my point. The gospel is for everyone. All right, so as we read these verses, how should they challenge us? And how should they encourage us? You know, as I read this, it encourages me because it tells me God included me. He included my family 
in his salvation plan. It encourages me because it's a simple yet life-changing process. It encourages me because it's a simple process. Repent, believe, receive. It encourages me because it's free to everyone. Yes, the wages of our sin is debt, but guess death. But guess what? Christ already paid that. He paid the price for our sin. So yes, it's free. Now these verses challenge me because as we're going to see in the next group of verses, some people have heard, but they've chosen to reject those truths. They will not embrace that truth. Or maybe there's some people who just yet to hear the message of the gospel. So now that we understand that the gospel message is for all people, there's some clear implications for us as Christians. And that's what we're going to explore in these next few verses. All right, so in those first uh, two or three verses, we saw that the message of salvation is confession and belief in Christ. In that second group of verses, we saw that the message of salvation in Christ is for all. But here's the third thing I want you to see. The message of salvation in Christ must be shared. Now, as we read this, I, I want you to listen to the cascade effect of Paul's thoughts in these verses here. Look at verse 14. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So, faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ. All right, now I want to pause here for just a sec and, and give you a, a short theology lesson. Okay, don't tune me out. This is good stuff. I don't want to see your eyes starting to glass over because I mentioned theology. This is basic theology 101, really. Um, we love and serve a God who has chosen to reveal himself to humankind. Now, he does this in a couple of different ways, uh, a couple of different categories that we use to describe that revelation. The first one is what theologians call general revelation, that we can see God in creation. The fact that there is design in creation implies a designer. The world around us declares the grace of God in a number of different ways. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. In other words, we can see God in creation. There's no excuse for not knowing that there is a God. However, Creation can only say so much about God's saving grace. That actually brings us to the second category of, of revelation. We call it special revelation. This form of revelation comes specifically through God's Word, either the written Word or the proclamation of the Word of God. You see, lost people can only hear the message of Christ when they either read about it in the Bible or when someone tells them about him. And here in verse 14, Paul asks, how can they hear without a preacher? Now, when Paul uses that term preacher, okay, he's not using it in the way that we would in, in 21st century Texarkana. When he uses that term preacher, in this particular context, it's not simply pointing to someone who is a minister, someone who's surrendered to vocational service to Christ, what he's saying is that the Lord has commissioned all believers to serve as heralds of the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. We are all preachers of the gospel. All right, so let's get down to the nitty-gritty here. I mean, let's get down to the main point of these last few verses. You see, before, we focused on the opportunity for all to trust the good news of Christ. But now what we need to focus on is our 
responsibility to share that good news of Christ. Because if mission impossible is ever going to become mission possible, it starts with you and me. It starts with us being committed to share in the mission of God. Now, there's a very popular saying. It's often erroneously attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. But it says this, Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Okay, so I think you'll understand, yes, of course, we should always be living our lives in such a way that the gospel is evident in the way we live. You know, Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 5, let your light so shine, you know, that people will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. It's Matthew 5, 16. <laughs> but this clever saying that's attributed to St. Francis, it, it actually omits one key truth, and that's this. Speaking the gospel, it's not optional. It is necessary to use words. Yes, an exemplary life of faith can show you that faith in action, can show people that, that faith in action, but it doesn't explain to a lost person how they can receive God's gift of grace and eternal life. So to reduce Paul's statements down to the lowest common denominator, to borrow a, a math term, we might paraphrase verses 14 through 17 like this. Okay? People must be sent to preach. Then they must preach. This is how someone hears the gospel message. And once they hear, then they can believe. And now that they believe, they can call upon Jesus to be their Savior. So believers, when we read these verses, we really ought to be reading them with a sense of urgency. Because you realize, okay, somebody's got to do the telling. You know, the only way that people are going to believe in Jesus is to hear about him, Paul says in verse 14. And Jesus has commissioned us, you and I, Beach Street First Baptist Church in Texarkana, Arkansas, and believers all over this globe. He has commissioned us to do the telling. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. That's the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Or Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit's come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now that does raise an interesting question. What if I can't go to the uttermost parts of the earth? Well, in addition to sharing the gospel with those people that we have immediate access to, you know, what else can we do to fulfill that great commission? Or to state it more specifically, how can we as Christians, as, as Baptists, be involved in communicating the gospel in places that we just can't go? Well, first of all, we pray. I mean, before we commit any undertaking, we need to pray. Pray for lost people. Pray for people we haven't even met yet. But pray and ask God to show you how you can be involved in sharing the gospel message. And you know what? He's going to answer that prayer. <laughs> I guarantee it. If he doesn't, I'll give you your money back. Yes, that was a joke. Um, we pray. We can contribute financially. You know, in the Baptist Church, we take up a couple of different offerings annually. There's the uh, Annie Armstrong offering, the Lottie Moon offerings. Those things help fund uh, missions here in North America through the North American Mission Board, uh, missions around the globe through the International Mission Board. We can send people from our church. I know there's a, a board over in the educational building that shows uh, several different missionary families, people that have gone out from this church that are being supported by that church. So we can send people out either 
on permanent assignments or short-term mission trips. We ourselves can volunteer for short-term missions trips. We can support multiple missionaries either directly or, you know, uh, as we sponsor church plants and that sort of stuff. That all helps to make the mission of spreading the gospel mission possible. But folks, whatever our form of preaching of the gospel takes, we need to remember something. We're really not responsible for the results, okay? We're really not responsible for how people react or respond to the gospel. What we are responsible for is to be faithful to the call to speak it. We just obey, we speak the truth, and we let the Holy Spirit take care of the results. But you know what? If we are not intentional about it, there's a lost world that's never going to have an opportunity to respond to the gospel. Church life is all too brief. Each one of us only has a short time here on earth to make an impact for the kingdom of God. So let's, as Paul said in Ephesians 5, let's redeem the time. Let's, let's carpe diem, you know, let's seize the opportunity before us to join in the fight for those who will one day stand with us before the throne of God. Why? Well, that's really the big idea of Romans chapter 10. Because God desires for all people to respond to the gospel. So here in Romans 10, Paul gives us a masterful explanation of the importance of the gospel in this passage. First of all, that the message of salvation is confession and belief in Christ. Second, that the message of salvation in Christ is for all. And then the third, that the message of salvation in Christ must be shared. It's important for us to remember that even though the Bible is an ancient document, you know, written initially to, to people, you know, eons ago. Well, not eons, but millennia ago. Thousands of years ago. It was also designed to be a very eminent, relevant, practical document for us to live by. Okay, so if that's the case, how do we take these truths and how do we put them into action? I think there's a number of different ways. Let, let me offer two or three. Very simple but practical ways to really put this, this scripture into action. Now, the first thing I would encourage you to do is to sit down, get a pen and paper, and write out your testimony. To really be all in for Mission Possible. You know, taking the message of the gospel to those who haven't heard it really begins with a clear explanation of your own story, your own journey to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm a firm believer in, in apologetics, you know, being equipped to defend the Christian faith. But you know what? There are a lot of times in this, in this life when the most powerful apologetic is the story of a transformed life. So sit down, write your story about how God changed you. Okay, so after you write your story, Here's an idea. Share your story. Share the gospel with someone. You know, just pray that the Holy Spirit would open the door, give you an opportunity to share. And when that opportunity presents itself, just share the story of how Jesus has changed your life. I mean, if you're called upon to tell what Jesus has done for you, I mean, it can start with something simple. Well, you know, God actually created me for personal relationship with Him, but because of my sinfulness, I was separated from Him. And I deserved to be condemned, to die. But guess what? Jesus Himself took that death upon Himself. He took the death sentence that was meant for me. He died in my place. And He has risen from the dead to offer me new spiritual life, union with God forever. I mean, that's the heart of the gospel right there. And that can be our testimony to the world. So write it down. Share with someone. And then pray. Pray for the lost people that God's going to bring into your own sphere of influence. 
Pray about being part of mission possible around the world. Now, for some of you, you know, that might mean giving to missions. For others, that might mean supporting a missionary with your time and your prayers. You know, it might be you sensing the call to go yourselves, either on a short-term project or maybe to surrender your whole life to, to missions. But pray. Pray that God will use you wherever you are and that you'll have the courage to answer when He calls you. So here in Romans 10, we've seen that salvation is summed up in our confession of and belief in Christ. We've seen that it's available to all, and we've seen that we have a responsibility to share that message of salvation in Christ. It's free for all. But just because salvation is free, that doesn't mean that it's cheap. You see, God redeemed us. He bought us back from enslavement to sin by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish, without spot, as Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. God, Paul says, demonstrated His love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ chose to die for us. That's Romans 5, 8. You see, for God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Indeed, there is no gift that's ever been so great, but no price so great has ever been paid for a gift. 